but I am. And, and they might not read that very last part. I mean, at that point, the, well, the exciting stuff's over. They got to read. If they read the last part, it'll fill in the gap. But please don't read the last part first. That's the problem. It gives away the whole story. But I want them to know what's true and false. That's only fair. That's a that's a they, they need to be able to do it. I'm hoping that they'll get stimulated enough. They'll want to read more. Do you think that we as a country are lacking in general in historical knowledge? I think we lack an appreciation of it. I think we've got plenty of knowledge everywhere, but we lack an appreciation of it. And what does it really matter? Uh, you know, why does history matter? History does matter. It matters an awful lot. And, you know, it's a shame, but it's changing. Novels like mine and others who write in my genre are, are creating a more of an awareness for it. And what do you think about his history education in this country? Well, it, it needs some adjustment. Uh, I just recently spoke to a group of educators in Tennessee. They brought me up to speak to the Tennessee history teachers. And we talked about that, you know, and the challenges that history teachers face and that I face as a novelist are almost identical. I have to hold your attention for 400 pages. They have to hold a student's attention for 170 or 80 days, however long school is. And they have to keep that motivated during that time period. We both have that. So I talked to them about some of the tricks I use that they might be able to use. Like what? Like well, number one is make it a story. Make it a story. You know, you can't make it about facts and figures. Yes, you've got to learn facts and figures, but make it a story. Number one thing you can do, and if more story form you can put it in, the more the student will appreciate it. And we talked about ways to do that. You know, um, I wonder if you think that there's a role for thriller writers in shaping public opinion about things. Well, I think we do a little bit, and we, I don't try to. None of us try to, but you know, Da Vinci Code certainly had some, some shaping of public opinion. There's no question about it. You know, Certain books take on that aura and can get people talking, and I, I try to find subject matters in my books that are interesting, that are topical, that are, that are rather relevant hopefully to get people uh, talking about it. But do I write it for that purpose? No. It's hard enough to write a novel. I certainly don't write one with a message in, in, hidden inside it. But is it is it a subject matter that I'd like to see more discussion about? Sure. The book we're discussing is called The Columbus Affair. Best-selling author Steve Barry is in the studio with me. He's also the founder of a nonprofit called History Matters. So in 2010, you and your wife Elizabeth created this nonprofit called History Matters. It's for historical preservation. Give us a little bit more information about that. We decided, you know, we were out, we were out in Oregon, and this, uh, this uh, archivist told me, he said, do you realize that there are millions of pages of documents around the world, or in, particularly in this country, in archives, and every second of every day, ink fades off the page, and you can't read them anymore. They're gone. They're gone forever. I never thought about that. I really didn't. And when he said that, we said, well, let's do something. So we created History Matters, and we go around the country, and we help raise money for historic preservation. Uh, we just were at the Mark Twain House uh, last week. We did an event there. We went up with Sandra Brown and R.L. Stein, and we had an evening. We had a gala. We had a cocktail party. We had all kinds of things, and we raised around $70,000 for the preservation of the Mark Twain House. We, we do it uh, various ways. We do those kinds of events, and we also do writer's workshops where Elizabeth and I teach a four-hour cr craft of writing workshop, very intense four hours. You basically learn in t four hours what I learned in 12 years. We whittle it down. And we've That's taught, convenient. <laughs> it is. It's, it's, we get to the meat. 2,000-plus students we've taught. We've done, you know, pushing on 40 projects around the country, and we've raised around $400,000 for various historical uh, projects. In these writing workshops, what kind of advice do you give to people that want to write? Oh, we go right to the meat of it. Where, you know, the first hour we talk about story structure, which is everything. We talk about dialogue. We talk about point of view. We talk about do's and don'ts. We get some real nuts and bolts stuff that applies everywhere, by the way, to fiction, nonfiction. I've had newspaper reporters. I've had magazine writers in there. It, 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 it's memoirs writers. Whatever you write, the vast majority of people who take the workshops don't write to be published. They write because they have a little voice in their head that tells them to write. So we get down to the nuts and bolts because craft is craft, and it's across the board. And we found that they've, it's been very beneficial. The students have really enjoyed it. You talked about in the foundation how you, you raise money and it's used for historical projects like the Mark Twain House. What other things have you, has your efforts gone towards? We have done uh, the Lincoln Log Cabin out in Illinois. We did the rare, book, uh, the rare Book Room at the Library of Virginia. We've done the P.T. Barnum Museum. 
We did a couple of museums out west. We've done three historic cemeteries, and we've done the Smithsonian. We were at the Smithsonian, and we did an event there to raise money for the Smithsonian libraries. You know, one of your books is called The Alexandria Link, Mm -hmm. and it revolves around the destruction 1,500 years ago of the Library of Alexandria, a lot of wisdom lost. I wonder, given your interest in preserving history, that must have really affected you. And I use it all the time because here's the cool part. People say all the time that Caesar burned the library. It sounds great, but he never did. It says the Christians burned it and got rid of it because it was paganism. Never happened. Then they say the Arabs came in and burned the papyri in their baths so that they would warm their baths and got rid of it. Never happened. The library simply rotted away. When the Ptolemies... I thought it burned to the ground. No, no, never did not. The warehouse burnt to the ground at the waterfront. The library itself, simply over a period of about three centuries, when the Ptolemies withdrew their funding, the locals just picked it apart, stone by stone, piece by piece. They picked it apart so clean that to this day, we have no idea where the building even stood. The foundation was picked away. Now, I use that all the time as an example that historic preservation matters because there's the greatest repository in the ancient world, and it just was allowed to rot away. Imagine what we lost. And I use that as an example all the time when we're trying to raise money. Part of your um, uh, writer's workshop at the Smithsonian is a tour of a rare book vault mm, it's pretty cool at place. the Smithsonian. What is that about? I've been there. It's a, They have this large room, and it's air-conditioned. It's about 55 degrees in there. Uh, and they have in there some of their most precious books, books that are very sensitive to air and to environment, things they don't show to the public. Uh, James Smithson's 100 books are actually in there. Most of Smithson's stuff burned in the 1865 fire that occurred in the Smithsonian, but the books were not in the fire. So they, pres- they, they are preserved, and they're in this vault. So the participants got a, a tour of that rare book vault. It's pretty cool. What's in there? Uh, a giant book. Uh, one that I remember particularly is this giant book of birds. It's a massive book. It's not an Audubon book. It was another volume of color uh, uh, drawings of all these birds that from the 19th century. There's some very precious religious texts in there. There's some Bibles in there that are very precious. And then, of course, Smithson's books. It's mainly their most uh, precious stuff that they can't put out that needs environmental control. Steve Barry is a best-selling author. His book is called The Columbus Affair. Steve, will you read to us from the very beginning of your book? Yeah, this is chapter one, when you first meet Tom. Tom Sagan gripped the gun. He thought about this moment for the past year, debating the pros and cons, finally deciding that one pro outweighed all cons. He simply did not want to live any longer. He'd once been an investigative reporter for the Los Angeles Times, knocking down a solid six-figure salary, his marquee byline generating one front page, above-the-fold story after another. He'd worked all over the world, Sarajevo, Beijing, Johannesburg, Belgrade, and Moscow. But the Middle East became his specialty, a place he came to know intimately, where his reputation had been forged. His confidential files were once filled with hundreds of willing sources, people who knew he'd protect them at all cost. He'd proved that when he spent 11 days in a D.C. jail for failing to reveal his source on a story about a corrupt Pennsylvania congressman. That man had gone to prison. Tom had received his third Pulitzer nomination. There were 21 awarded categories. One was for distinguished investigative reporting by an individual or team reported as a single newspaper article or series. Winners received a certificate, $10,000, and the ability to add three precious words, Pulitzer Prize winner, to their names. He won his, but they took it back, which seemed the story of his life. Everything had been taken back. Steve Barry reading from his book called The Columbus Affair. Steve, why uh, why a journalist this time? Well, I wanted someone who had some world knowledge and had some ability across the world and some uh, inquisitive nature to him. I wanted someone who had the ability to ferret out facts and be particular with details. And I wanted someone who had suffered uh, a problem, who'd been disgraced. So I figured out a way, and I studied about five or six different cases of disgraced journalists over the last 20, 25 years and, you know, just sort of merged them all together and created Tom. Now, Tom has been set up. He, 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 he's been disgraced for falsifying a story, but he was set up, and only he knows that. No one can, only he's the only one in the world who knows it, and so this is his last chance. And do all your heroes have marital problems? Uh, no. Well, yeah, I guess they say they do. Yeah, <laughs> now, now think about it. Well, Cotton's, you know, divorced. So, you know, Cotton is divorced, so he's not— 
But he, that's a marital problem, I assume. Yeah, because in Alexandria Link, you uh, we dealt with that very strongly with the wife in there and with Pam. Um, yeah, I guess so. I was a divorce lawyer for 30 years, so I guess it kind of spilled over a little bit. Yeah. Are there any other similarities between you and the heroes? Me and Cotton are pretty much the same guy. Yeah, I, I model Cotton after me because when I created him in the Templar Legacy, I had no clue that he was going to get to stay around for eight or nine, ten books. I wanted him to, but I didn't know, so I just used me. Tom is not really me. Tom is just a, a little bit of, he's really completely created. But, you know, does a little of you kind of get in there? Of course it does, but Cotton is basically me, yeah. Where does he get that nickname, Cotton? Uh, it was named by a lady in my writer's group. I had named him something else, and she said it was a pretty stupid name. And so I said, well, do you have a better name? And she said, yes, I do. Let's call him Cotton. I said, you got it. That's it. And, uh, <laughs> but it Cotton's a, a kind of a stupid name, though. Well, it is for, uh, it isn't for a southern guy. Okay. It's from where he is, from where he is, for southern, and Cotton's from Georgia. So that's a, that's a nickname. Now, his name is Harold Earl Malone, and he's called Cotton. Now, why is he called Cotton? We don't say that in the books. We always say long story, long story. There is a story how Cotton got his name that we'll tell one day. But how he got it in the real world was one of the ladies in the writer's group, Deva, I gave her credit for it in the Templar Legacy. It's a great name. Do you think you'll ever try nonfiction? It'd be interesting to do. I, I wouldn't say never. I don't know if I'll get the opportunity. I'd love to do historical fiction, pure historical fiction. That would be really cool to do. You mean without the thriller part? Yes, yeah, just a historical fiction. I love historical fiction. You know, Sharon K. Penman's one of my favorite writers. Michener's my favorite writer of all time. I love that stuff, you know. Uh, Follett, Pillars of the Earth, you know, uh, World Without End. Those are, you know, those are great books. I love that stuff. Um, maybe one day that would be kind of fun to do, and I, and I wouldn't mind writing a fantasy novel. That'd be kind of fun, too. What's the book after this one about? Uh, Cotton's coming back. He just gets a year off, and uh, it's really cool. We He's on sabbatical, right? Yeah, <laughs> but I brought him back, and we stumbled onto a legend in England two years ago. We were in a little village, and a lady was telling me a story that I'd never heard before, and it was really cool, and it involved the Tudors and, mm -hmm. uh, and Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, and so I made a, a thriller out of it. It's called The King's Deception. And it's uh, Cotton Malone's next adventure, his eighth adventure. It will come out May 7th, 2013. How long does it take you to write one of these books? To write it, 12 months. From start to finish, 18 months. I have to do six months of preliminary research, and I do that while I'm writing the previous book. So I, I would have done, while I'm, while I'm writing Columbus Affair, I did six months of preliminary research for King's Deception. So I finish Columbus Affair one day, I start King's Deception the next day. The reason why is I need 12 months. I need all 12. I need every day to do it. So I can't, I don't have the luxury of just stopping and taking a year, a month off or whatever. That, it, it doesn't work. So uh, like right now I'm writing, um, I've, uh, I finished up King's Deception. I'm writing the 2014 book, but I'm also researching 2015 at the same time because I have to start that. It takes six months of, of good preliminary research before I get going. And travel. Yes, we usually have at least one or two trips. Columbus Affair involved Prague and uh, Jamaica that we had never been to both places, uh, and uh, we had to go and check out some things there. Kings you had to go. Had to go. It, it sounds like it sounds like fun. <laughs> Such hard work. <laughs> it's not quite as fun as you think it is, uh, because uh, they're very stressful. Because when you get there, you don't you don't know what you're looking for. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to come. So we have to search. And we, we set a four-day limit on these trips so that we have a time limit on us. And hopefully we find it. Luckily, we, find, we have found what we're looking for. The, English, uh, the King's Deception involved two trips to England. Steve Barry, he's a best-selling author of 12 books. He's also the founder of a nonprofit called History Matters, dedicated to preserving our history. The book is The Columbus Affair, and it's published by Ballantine Books. Steve, thanks so much for being on the program. Great to be here. Thank you.